Uh, today's actually our due date. So if my phone rings, this might be the fastest TEDx talk in history. Uh, and if the baby doesn't come out today, that's great. Uh, we may name him Ted, uh, just in honor of letting me do this today. So, um, But what I'm actually here to speak about is story. Stories change the world. They change us when we say them. They change us when we hear them. And I think they can change communities and, as I said, change the world. Um, never has this struck me more than when I was a counselor. You're a professional, active listener. I remember hearing stories from brave people every day. Every day. The 80-year-old men who would finally tell their difficult story about surviving childhood sexual abuse. Shaking. A story they only ever told their wives about. Young women who had been through things like abduction, sexual abuse, sex work, telling their stories, hoping to get through their 20s learning how to trust again. And children of, of all ages grieving loss of all kinds. Brave people tell their stories. And I met those brave people daily. One of the things that we have to look at is how it changes the individual who says the story, the individual who hears the story, and as I said, communities in the world. So how does it change the individual who, who shares their story? There's a lot of really fascinating research out there right now. Um, Slepian, Massey, and Campo, and Ambadi have done research that shows that holding our stories in and our secrets, because often they're the same thing, actually has a real effect on us. And not in this poetic or metaphoric way, but it actually weighs us down. Research that they did showed that when we're thinking about our secrets and holding them in, we'll actually judge a hill to be steeper than it is, or the distance between us and something to be further away than it actually is. It's real and perceptible. And when we actually tell our stories, or we unburden ourselves, our judgments not only become more accurate, they also become less negative. Other things are happening to us physically, too, when we tell our stories. Casalino, in his wonderful book, The Neuroscience of Psychotherapy, talks about how counselors are actually amygdala whispers. The amygdala is a part of our brain, it's in our limbic system, and it helps regulate things like emotion, survival instinct, really important stuff. And he calls us amygdala whisperers because one of the things we're trying to do is get clients to tell and retell their stories, to develop new associations. So if somebody had uh, a, a really negative traumatic story in their life about something like intimacy, that was fraught with trauma and abuse, maybe retelling the story in new and novel ways will change the associations and change the meanings. And if we're able to get people to tell a story in a new way about their past, we're able to get them to think about new stories for their future, new possibilities. Right? When we tell our stories, the left and the right brain actually integrate in a neurological way. It's a physical change. So perceptually, neurologically, we have these physical changes that are occurring. One of the other things that we're seeing with storytelling is its effectiveness in terms of actually counseling. And what I mean is we're seeing means of storytelling that have only ever been normally reserved for professional storytellers used in counseling. Things like video, things like filmmaking, uh, photography, a photo voice where you take narratives almost like a podcast and put it over photos to tell a story about your life again, in a new and novel way. When we do this, we're actually reorganizing our brains. And this is the whole goal, goal of most psychotherapy. The thing we used to do at the campfire, tell a story about our lives, is actually cutting edge psychotherapy now. Telling your story changes you. Okay, telling your story also changes the listener. My wife and I, we're both counselors. And in fact, uh, there's not been a time in the last 10 years where one or both of us haven't been counseling, learning about counseling, writing about counseling, or teaching counseling. So we've thought about this quite a bit. And I am more than open to admit that before I was a member of the helping professions, I was a horrible listener. I was that like sleazeball person who looked you in the eye, furrowed his brow, acting like he was listening, but the whole time I was just thinking about what I was gonna say next. It's a horrible way to live your life. Right? You don't actually retain anything. It wasn't until I got into the helping professions where I realized, wait a second, being there as that, again, professional secret keeper, active listener, witness, 
As people give testimony about their lives, people telling their stories for the first time, difficult stories, being there to witness that is really important, worthwhile, and helpful. And I know I'm oversimplifying it. There's so much more to what happens in psychotherapy and counseling, but that part's really important, and sometimes we lose sight of it. We think that when we go to counseling uh, as the client, we're there to be changed. Absolutely. Right? You're there to learn new things, put new things in your backpack, new skills, whatever it might be. But you're not the only one being changed. The client and the counselor are changing each other constantly through the use of storytelling. So we have a goalpost of when somebody tells their story, it changes them physically and emotionally. It helps their mental health and their functioning. When somebody hears their story and they're open to that experience, they hear it and feel an echo of somebody else's experience. It helps them and changes them. So wouldn't it posit that in these micro-counseling examples of encouraging people to tell their story, that change can happen at a community level and a world level through storytelling? Marshall Gann seems to think so. Marshall's an incredible guy. I've had an uh, opportunity to work with him. He endorsed two of my political campaigns. I uh, recently took a, course, uh, took a course that he facilitates at a Harvard's Kennedy School on the power of narrative. And he has this idea about change-making public narrative. So in the same way that we have people tell their stories individually for change, we can do it in a public way for the same goals. And in the public narrative, there's three stories we tell. The story of self, the story of us, and the story of now. The story of self is the story about why you have been called to act. What is it that happened to you? And it's never stats, right? Stats can support our stories, but stats don't inspire people to act. Marshall believes that stories teach us how to act, but also can inspire us to act. And the story of self is, again, that story that, that you realize something's a problem that needs to be solved because something happened to you or you witnessed something. My story of self, the reason I got involved in community development and politics is because when I was little, 10 years old, I remember selling out selling out my values for a ride. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, uh, I remember having at the age of 10 to broker rides between uh, other parents. I, I grew up on the system, uh, product of divorce. Uh, my mother didn't have a car and I was really ashamed. Not of those things. My mom's wonderful and there's nothing wrong with being poor. But of having to sell out in order to get involved in extracurriculars, a thing we tell young people to do all the time. Because there was a lack of transit, because there was a lack of, of a vehicle in my home, um, I remember doing things like having to, and I'm changing the names here, but having to uh, make friends with Jenny's racist parents because they had a minivan. And my friend Carl, his parents were awesome, but they had three kids and no room in their car in order to do things like get to a science fair. Right? And I'm, I'm selling out my own values at a really young age. When I was in high school, in grade nine, I got into a school play. And the only reason I was able to do the play was because the teacher, Susan Dignan, that name hasn't changed, but because the teacher agreed to drive me home after every practice and every performance because we didn't have transit at our school. And I realized, as this was happening, trying to sell tickets to young people uh, to come to dances and plays and things like that, that there were other young people who, because of lack of public transit, weren't able to participate in extracurriculars. So we tried some Band-Aid solutions, right? Movie nights, uh, free pizza, uh, trying to do some, uh, essentially what's now, I guess, ride chairs. But those were Band-Aids. It wasn't structural change. And it wasn't until we got people to sign a petition, young people, we got them to fill the city hall here in Brantford. Uh, we had the newspaper write articles about what we did. And about eight months later, we had a bus route. I learned at the age of 14, you can fight city hall and win. And if you can do that at 14, you can do that at 40, you can do that at 50, any group of people can do that. And it was a really important lesson to me, and that's my story of self, at least one of them. The story of us is a story about our shared values and our shared experience. The story of us is so important. It's, you might have seen hints of it in my story of self, right? If other students are signing a petition, that's a story of us. But the story of us doesn't have to be the exact same. Not everybody had my exact same situation, but had similar situations. So I'll give you an example, a few, or a few of them anyway. One example would be uh, the student who had a car in their household, but they had alcoholic parents, and they didn't want them picking them up at 10 o'clock after a dance, being drunk and having to drive home with their drunk parents, right? I see some nods in the audience. Some other students, older ones, couldn't accept co-op opportunities because there wasn't any public transit. They couldn't accept an after-school job because by the time the school bus got them home and then they could get on a city bus, they would have missed their shift. So they had to say no to those opportunities. Still other people, maybe they wanted to be involved in sports and not a play. 
and they couldn't because of this lack of transit. So that story of, of us, that's a story of a community and how it's affected. And then the story of now, it's a story of urgency. It's why the thing that we are trying to fight for can't wait another two years and it can't wait another 10 years. It has to happen soon. The story of now is also the story of how you're gonna organize, why you're gonna be successful, why what you're doing is right. So stats don't do that. Stories do that. I'll give you an example. If you've ever heard a politician rattle on stats about indigenous underfunding of schools, you may care about that issue. You may sympathize with that issue, but you're not gonna retain those statistics very long or very well. If instead, on top of the stats, you hear somebody from a First Nations community, an indigenous community, talk about how they've never seen a school, a real school in their lifetime, because before they were born, their school was condemned, and they built portables on toxic land, and fumes come in through the vents and through the windows, and this causes young people to be violently ill at school, and their parents and the kids themselves are both saying we can't go to school anymore because it's not a safe place to be. And the reason this is happening is because of chronic underfunding of indigenous schools compared to their provincial counterparts. You're gonna remember that. You're gonna be called to act. You're gonna be able to transmit that story and share it with other people. That's what the kids who started the largest youth movement in Canadian history, Shannon's Dream did. They told their stories online, on YouTube, videos, television, in the media, at Parliament Hill and at other schools. They developed allies who then shared these stories as well. And they're demanding and getting structural change in the funding formulas. They're getting schools built in a way no politician, no stats report, and no Senate subcommittee has ever done. That's how it changes communities. How does it change the world? It's pretty current right now, but you just have to look at hashtag me too. Right? Men, for a very long time, have understood the stats about sexual abuse, sexual harassment. We've heard them. We, we understand in, a, in a, a way of thinking that this is a big problem. But stats can be about someone else. We don't have to conceptualize them as about us and our friends and people around us. So when you see a lot of stats saying that this is a prevalent common issue, great. Maybe we should do something about that sometime. And then some famous people start using the hashtag me too and telling their story. And maybe you admire some of those people, but it's still, you know, that's a Hollywood problem. I don't have to look at my behavior because that's, you know, famous people. Except that process of storytelling, those stories of self start turning into the stories of us because other women start to think about it. And whether they put a hashtag me too or just tell somebody uh, about their story or express support for a story, and other people's stories, those stories of self becoming stories of us build momentum. And suddenly men are looking around going, wait, there's a lot of people I know and a lot of people I love using this hashtag and telling their stories. Maybe I do have to examine my behavior. Maybe this is men like me or men I know, myself included, that are perpetuating this. Maybe it's not six or 600 guys I don't know doing this because people I know and love having this happen to them in my feed, on all my social media, it's disturbing. Now women have known this for a long time because they've been experiencing it. And men are very late to this. But I'm seeing the story of us turn into the story of now because I'm seeing men tell stories. I'm seeing men tell stories about what they could have done better. I'm seeing men tell stories about what they did and what they were doing and what they should do, right? Rewriting narratives to change their own behavior. We're on the cusp of some change here, and all of that happens because of stories. None of it happens because of stats. Some brave people, some brave people tell their story in a counseling session. Great. Some brave people tell their stories to the public at large. Wonderful. But stories change us when we tell them, physically, emotionally. Stories change us when we hear them, they change major aspects of our personality. They change our politics. And stories change communities. They get schools built. And when enough people are listening, indeed, stories change the world. Thank you.